So let's restart this thing by going back in time. Welcome to the origin story of Silicon Valley, the beginning of chip wars. In this 23rd episode, before we catch up on the chip industry today, let's take a look at its entrepreneurial roots. But first, if you'd like to support the channel, I've linked to Amazon below. Every Amazon purchase you make makes a big difference. Now, if you're here to learn about how computing technology moves ahead, Chip Wars is officially back in rotation. But to kick things off, this episode will be a little different. Let's look at how Chip Wars began. Like its California 49er Gold Rush tradition of striking it out on your own, Silicon Valley continuously prospects for new opportunities. But instead of relying on dynamite and manpower, the Silicon Valley Gold Rush is propelled by science, engineering, and innovation. Let's take a tour and remember how the early educators, leaders, and engineers established a culture of innovation that has made Silicon Valley the most dynamic cluster in the world. This is the story of a university fertilizing the valley, rebellious engineers working the land, the government and private investors providing the money, and the ambitious visionaries who showed future entrepreneurs how to break with tradition to build something great. Part 1. Stanford Fertilizes the Valley Founded by a railroad tycoon, Stanford University's early mission focused on West Coast independence from East Coast financial hegemony. The goal was to build a self-sufficient, indigenous, West Coast economy. One professor, Frederick Terman, inspired many of Stanford's young engineers to start their own companies in order to create better computers than the mainframes coming from the East Coast. This professor encouraged both faculty and students to come up with new ideas and form new companies encouraging the high-tech sector here in Silicon Valley. And once all these innovations began taking root, the U.S. government stepped in in order to encourage innovation in military technology. Because of companies that were created during his tenure, companies like HP and others, this man is known as the father of Silicon Valley. Part 2. The Traitorous Eight Although computers had been around since the 1930s, they had a huge engineering problem. Performance didn't scale. To increase performance, engineers had to manually add extra handmade vacuum tubes, making these early computers huge and unreliable power hogs. These mainframe computers were prone to human error and uneconomically massive and complex. As performance increased, the losses from failures and downtime exceeded the expected benefits. Then we had the first breakthrough, the transistor, a smaller, more reliable solid-state semiconductor that regulates the flow of electricity. Suddenly, all the major established tech corporations were in a race to commercialize the transistor. But the smart money was on William Shockley, the Nobel Prize winning inventor of the transistor and a former employee of Bell Labs. So now with venture capital support, Shockley decided to set up shop here in this building in Mountain View in order to work closer to his mother and near Stanford University. But because it was mostly a farming community, it was really difficult for him to convince other engineers to join his cause. So it was mostly young, adventurous PhDs who joined him and decided to take a chance and start their careers here in this building. Almost immediately, the small group of engineers realized that they made a huge mistake. Even though Shockley was brilliant, his paranoid and erratic behavior made him almost impossible to work with. So after Shockley ordered his new engineers to stop research of silicon-based transistors in favor of his germanium-based transistors, these eight engineers held a secret meeting to do something unheard of in 1950s America. On September 18, 1957, these eight engineers, headed by Robert Noyce, collectively declared their entrepreneurial independence with their signatures on this dollar bill. At the time, this was business blasphemy. Quitting and going out on your own meant the end of your career. Most employees followed the rules because it was safer. Bureaucracy was less risky. Most people worked at a single company forever. But the courage of these eight engineers gave birth to the digital revolution. These eight brilliant and ambitious engineers embarked on a new path a path that would forever define Silicon Valley's disruptive culture and nature. But although they were smart and talented, they needed an investor and a big customer in order to make their startup succeed. Two weeks later, the Soviets launched their first satellite, Sputnik, into outer space. Because the U.S. feared for its national security and technological leadership, the Traitorous 8 now had a potentially lucrative customer for its semiconductors, fueling the race to space 
and missile defense. Then with the help of an East Coast investor and potentially lucrative contracts from NASA and Lockheed, Fairchild Semiconductor opened up for business here in this building in 1957. This original Silicon Valley startup made a point that still reverberates throughout the area today, that you can learn more and innovate faster by going out and creating your own business. The established corporations that were moving slowly just could not keep up. So while Shockley Semiconductor labeled these eight engineers the traitorous eight, they actually established a culture of innovation and disruption that has defined Silicon Valley ever since. Part 3. Fairchild Grows Silicon in the Valley Every startup needs a visionary, someone crazy enough to believe in a future that most people don't believe. For Silicon Valley, Robert Noyce was the visionary prototype. He believed in a market of silicon transistors that could fuel not just the U.S. government's space and defense ambitions, but also a future consumer electronics industry. But as demand for transistors took off during the Cold War, performance hit a wall. Because transistors were discrete, people needed to manually add more transistors by hand to boost performance. And while transistors were definitely more reliable than vacuum tubes, the connections between these transistors were still prone to error and corrosion. Then, in 1958, two people figured out how to shrink multiple transistor parts onto a single integrated silicon circuit. One man was the employee of the largest semiconductor corporation in the world. The other? Robert Noyce, a startup entrepreneur. Jack Kilby, a Texas Instrument employee, combined all the parts onto the same material, a semiconductor called germanium, the same material used by William Shockley. But the U.S. military needed transistors that could perform well under high temperatures. Germanium just couldn't make the cut. And with the Russians beating the U.S. with the first satellite into space, President Eisenhower made a massive bet by creating NASA and betting that smaller companies could innovate faster than the centrally planned Soviet economy. So Robert Noyce and his partners not only came up with better production techniques that resulted in more reliable chips, but they also had the best yields in the industry. Fairchild Semiconductor made cheaper and more reliable chips. The Traitorous 8's big bet that silicon would take over Santa Clara Valley paid off as Fairchild Semiconductors were used in U.S. missiles, the space race, and the burgeoning consumer electronics industry. But every disruptive company must eventually face off and battle with other competitors in the industry. Part 4. The First Chip Wars On September 27, 1960, Fairchild tested the first semiconductor integrated circuit in this building. But Texas Instruments held the patent for a similar integrated circuit made by its employee, Jack Kilby. And so emerged another key characteristic of Silicon Valley's fast-paced innovation culture the patent wars. Both claimed to hold the same patent to the integrated circuit, but ultimately Fairchild's better technology and production process grew faster than the Texas Instruments chips. Basically, Fairchild had better products at a lower price. And after all the dust settled from this first chip battle, both Fairchild and Texas Instruments settled their patent war with a cross-license agreement in 1966. But Fairchild had a valuable and underestimated advantage over its traditional larger corporate competitors. Robert Noyce created a company driven by egalitarian teamwork, a meritocracy. Fairchild broke down the barriers between managers and workers in order to find the best ideas. And this is how Silicon Valley got its name and its culture. Universities encourage entrepreneurship, engineers value innovation over tradition, and a meritocratic business culture removes barriers in constant search for smart solutions. All these things combined attract a perpetually young culture focused on creating the future through innovation. By always asking, how can things be different? But there was a growing problem with Fairchild. Remember that East Coast investor that first gave money to the traitorous eight? He got greedy. Treating Fairchild Semiconductor like a cash cow, he milked away the profits while neglecting to reinvest in the semiconductor business. This gave Motorola and Texas Instruments a chance to catch up. So while Fairchild suffered from a lack of resources, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore began to talk about starting a new company. This new venture would entrench the startup culture that would inspire future entrepreneurs and leaders and ultimately end up with the invention of the microprocessor. But we'll save that story for the next episode.
I forgot the rest. What is it? You got this wrong. I know. Because the U.S. government feared for its national security. Action! So far, I think this is the hardest one. Yeah. Do you need to be motivated? Come on, you can do it, Theo! <laughs>